Teresa of Avila, The Book of My Life Prologue If only someone would invite me to make a detailed list of all the things I have done wrong in my life. Instead, I have been asked to freely describe my spiritual practice and to record all the blessings my Lord has showered on me. I would be so much more comfortable disclosing my imperfections, but I have taken a vow of obedience that forces me to keep those things to myself. All I can do is to beg you who are reading this account of my life to please, for the love of God, bear in mind that it has been much more wicked than I am at liberty to say. In fact, I keep searching among all the saints, studying the stories of their awakenings, looking for even one who can serve as a role model for me. But no, once God called them, they never turned away from him again. I, on the other hand, grew even worse. I seem to have made it my personal mission to do whatever I could to deny every blessing he has bestowed on me. I knew that I should strive to serve him better. But I also knew that I myself was powerless to offer my beloved what he deserved. May he, who has waited so long for me, be forever blessed. I ask him now with the whole of my heart to give me the grace of absolute clarity and perfect truth so that I may write this account of my life as I have been asked to do. I have felt for a long time that my Lord wanted me to write this, but I have not dared to begin until now. May this writing be an offering of praise and glory to my Lord. May it help my spiritual guides to know me better and so to better support my spiritual development. May I find the strength now to give back even a fraction of the great gifts I have received from God. And may He be adored by all things forever. Amen. Part 1. My Turbulent Youth Chapter 1. A Child's Passion for God There was no valid reason for me to be so wicked. My parents were righteous people who revered God, and God granted me the option of being good as well. I had all the help I needed to curtail my negative tendencies, but I was incorrigible. My father loved good books. He had some that were written in Spanish so his children could read them, and they had a positive influence on me. My mother made sure that we all said our prayers and offered devotion to Our Lady and to certain saints. When I was around six or seven years old, exposure to these holy things began to stir something in me. It helped that I never saw either of my parents act with anything other than integrity. They were both blessed with many virtues. My father, for instance, had great compassion for the poor and sympathy for the sick. He was kind to his servants and could not bear to keep slaves. In fact, when one of his brother's Moorish slaves was staying at our house, my father treated her like one of his own children. He couldn't stand it that she was not free, he said. My father spoke only the truth. Nobody ever heard him swear or gossip. He was a profoundly decent man. My mother, too, was a deeply virtuous woman and absolutely honest. She struggled with illness throughout her life. Even though she was incredibly beautiful, she never paid attention to her looks. In fact, by the time she died at age 33, she was already dressing with the dignity of a much more mature woman. My mother was deeply serene and exceptionally intelligent. She endured terrible trials during her time on this earth, but she died in the fullness of Christ's love. We were a family of three sisters and nine brothers, and by the grace of God, all were as virtuous as our parents. Except for me. Even so, I was my father's favorite. There actually might have been some reason for this at one time. Before I started rebelling against God, I believed that God had given me some very good inclinations. It causes me such pain now to remember how I took these blessings for granted and did not make use of them. I loved all my brothers and sisters, and they loved me. They certainly never stood in my way or prevented me from serving God. I had one brother close to my own age whom I loved best of all. 
We used to read the lives of the saints together. When I read about certain women saints who endured martyrdom for the sake of God, I concluded that death was a small price to pay for the utter joy they were given in return when they were whisked away to heaven. I desperately wanted to die like this. Not out of holy devotion, at least not that I was aware of, but from sheer urgency to get a hold of the sublime fruits that my books promised were stored up for me. My brother and I would discuss how we could best make martyrs of ourselves. We decided to head off to the country of the Moors, begging bread along the way, and ask them to please, for the love of God, chop off our heads. I believe that our Lord had given us, even at such a tender age, the courage to follow up on our plan. The only thing stopping us was the fact that we had parents. You know how it is said that both pain and glory are eternal? My brother and I used to spend hours pondering this together. Forever, we would say, forever, forever. It seemed that my frequent repetition of this phrase knocked on God's door and offered me a lasting glimpse of the way of truth when I was only a small child. When I finally accepted that there was nowhere I could go where I could convince them to kill me for the sake of God, my brother and I decided to become holy hermits. In the small orchard behind our house, we would pile up stones to build our hermitages. But they immediately came tumbling down, thwarting our project over and over again. Even now, as I remember how young I was, when God gave me the precious gift of devotion, I am filled with sadness to see how I lost it along the way through my own carelessness. As much as I could, which was not much at all, I gave alms to the poor. I tried to be alone whenever I said my prayers, and I prayed often. My mother had a disciplined practice of saying the rosary, and she inspired the same commitment in us. When I played with other little girls, I loved to pretend that we were building convents to live in. I think I always wanted to be a nun, but unfortunately I wanted other things more. When I was around 12 years old, my mother died. When it began to dawn on me what I had lost, I was overcome by grief. Weeping uncontrollably, I threw myself at the feet of an image of Our Lady and pleaded with her to be my mother now. It seems to me that even though I made this prayer with naive simplicity, she answered me. I have found that whenever I have placed myself in her circle of mercy, the Blessed Mother has turned to unfold me. It disturbs me deeply now to see that somewhere along the way, I abandoned so many of the good impulses I had begun to cultivate. Oh, my beloved, it appears that you are determined to save me. May it please you to do it. You have already poured such a bounty of blessings upon me. What I don't understand is why you have allowed this dwelling of my soul where you have chosen to live, to remain in such a terrible mess. It's not for my own advantage that I ask, but for your honor and glory. Why am I even saying this? I already know it's my own fault. You did everything you could possibly do from the time I was very young to make me fully yours. I can't blame my parents either, since all I ever saw in them was pure goodness and concern for my well-being. As I passed through childhood, I began to become aware of the many natural graces my Lord had bestowed on me. Instead of giving thanks for these gifts, I started to use them against him, as I will now explain. Chapter 2 Falling Dangerously in Love What I am about to disclose is a reflection of the period, it seems to me, when I began to do myself harm. Sometimes I think it is negligent for parents not to set up every possible obstacle in the lives of their children to prevent them from being exposed to anything but virtue. My mother, as I mentioned, was a very good woman herself, but as I grew older, I did very little, almost nothing, in fact, to emulate her goodness. Instead, I seemed to be inexorably drawn toward bad things, which started to do damage to my soul. My mother was very fond of romance novels, and so was I. But they did not have the negative effects on her they had on me. For one thing, she never allowed them to interfere with her work. 
Her children, on the other hand, were always stealing time to read. My mother allowed this indulgence partly because it kept us occupied and so lightened her own load a little, and partly because she herself found sweet escape from the many trials she suffered in the pages of those books. This pastime of ours annoyed my father to such a degree that we went to great lengths to make sure that he did not catch us doing it. But what was for my mother a harmless habit became a raging addiction for me. Any impulse I had toward goodness began to cool, and I started looking for trouble. I didn't think there was anything wrong with my wasting long hours, day and night, in such a useless enterprise as devouring these insipid tales, even though I had to hide it from my father. I became so intensely immersed in reading romances that unless I had a new book lined up behind the last one, I was not happy. Then I started taking inordinate pride in my appearance. I dressed in the latest fashions, doused myself with perfumes, pampered my hands, and fussed with my hair. I was fastidious and vain, grasping for all the trinkets I could find to enhance my beauty. My intentions were not dishonorable in the sense that I would never have wanted anyone to offend God because of me, but I was overly concerned about how I looked and smelled and seemed. These things did not feel sinful to me, and so I spent years preoccupied with them. My father was very careful about who was allowed into our house, but we had some questionable cousins who visited often. Oh, if only he had been careful about those cousins as well. In retrospect, I see how dangerous it is to allow children to be exposed to certain influences just at the time when the seeds of their virtues are starting to germinate. It's not that such people are wicked in themselves, but they have a way of arousing wicked desires in others. Like me. The cousins were around my age, some a little older. We spent most of our time together. They adored me, and I made it my project to amuse with my conversation and offer my rapt attention whenever they recounted their own inane escapades. There was nothing worthwhile in these exchanges. In fact, even worse, I began to feel my soul being pulled into a vortex of evil. If I were to offer some advice to parents, it would be this. Pay attention to who it is that your children are associating with. Bad company can do a great deal of damage. And young people are naturally inclined to follow what is worse for them rather than what is best. This was certainly the case for me. My sister Maria was much older than I was. Even though she was honest and kind and pure of heart, I learned nothing from her. Instead, I studied every kind of wickedness from an older relative of mine who was often in our house. This cousin was so frivolous and superficial that it irritated my mother to have her around. Really, I think my mother must have had some idea of what a negative effect this girl was having on me. But there were so many reasons for her to be there that it was no use trying to keep her away. We gossiped constantly and confided our deepest secrets to one another. She accompanied me in all the things I'd like to do and introduced me to activities I had never dreamed of. When I was around 14, I began to grow even closer to this cousin. I had never before committed a mortal sin, not so much out of fear of God as from concern about my own reputation. This obsession with my image is what prevented me from losing my honor altogether. To tell the truth, I don't think there was anything or anyone I loved enough in the whole world to justify surrendering my virtue. My innate attachment to my own honor probably would have kept me from going against the honor of God in any case. What I didn't realize was all the subtle ways in which I was sacrificing my honor every day. I couldn't have cared less about the deeper meanings of virtue and integrity, but I did go to great lengths to make sure that my image and reputation remained intact. All I really cared about was that I not pass the point of no return. My father and my older sister were not at all pleased by my association with this cousin of mine, and they made no secret of their disapproval. But since there was nothing they could do to stop her from coming over, their protesting my friendship with her did no good at all. Besides, when it came to figuring out ways to do bad things, I was extremely clever. If I had not experienced it myself, I would not believe how seriously one person can poison another's soul. This is particularly problematic when a person is young. 
Listen to me, parents, and beware. My connection with this young woman changed me completely. I lost almost all of my motivation to do good in the world. Plus, the relationship opened the door for me to associate with another person who influenced me to do even more dangerous things. If only I had associated with worthy companions at that age. If only I had been around peers who modeled devotion to God. Then I might have retained my virtue. Then my soul might have grown strong enough not to stumble and fall. Finally, all fear of God drained out of me, and what was left was this vain concern for my worldly reputation, which tortured me. But as long as I thought no one noticed, this worry did not prevent me from doing all kinds of things to risk offending God and shaming myself. My behavior began to take on a self-destructive quality. I cannot blame my cousins for this. It was my own fault. After a while, my own wicked inclinations were more than enough to lead me into trouble. Our servants did little to protect me from myself. In fact, they seemed to encourage my wild antics. If any of them had attempted to guide me back on track, I might have paid attention to them and avoided all kinds of grief. But they were as blinded by their own interests as I was by desire. Still, something in me always prevented me from falling into utter disgrace. The truth is, I was an essentially modest girl who preferred the company of wholesome people. Whenever an opportunity came along to do something truly deceitful, I worried about the effect it might have on my father and my brothers. God, it seems, did not want to lose me. Against my will, he delivered me from danger, but not before I did grave damage to my coveted reputation. My private escapades were turning out to be not as private as I believed. Not even three months had gone by since I began to experiment with these rebellious behaviors. When my father began to suspect what I had been doing, he sent me off to Our Lady of Grace, a nearby Augustinian convent. It was a place where young people like me, though far less extreme in their misdeeds, could stay out of trouble and receive an education. We managed to keep the real reason for my leaving concealed from almost everyone except a few close relatives. They had been looking for an excuse to send me away, and finally they found one. My sister had married and moved away. I had no mother. And a girl in my position could not be expected to live alone without the care of an older woman. The convent was deemed the only proper place for me. My father's love for me was so unconditional and my skills of deception so refined that he never accepted that my behavior had been anything other than harmless. And so, though I deserved it, I never fell out of my father's favor. It had not been going on long enough for me to arouse too much suspicion. I had made such an effort to conceal my sins and preserve my good name that although my relatives had some idea what was going on, nothing could be proven. What I forgot to take into consideration is that nothing is secret from the one who sees all things. Oh, my beloved. We do such harm in this world when we forget this. Such harm when we believe that there is anything we can do to dishonor you that you will not notice. I'm sure we would avoid a great deal of suffering if we could just remain mindful of you at all times and protect ourselves, not from other human beings, but from our own negative impulses which lead us to neglect you. For my first week at Our Lady of Grace, I was miserable. It wasn't the place that upset me, but the fear that everyone suspected what a shallow girl I was. You see, I was already growing weary of the superficial values I had been embracing. And I had never really stopped holding God in my heart. The minute I missed the mark, I was always rushing to atone for it. In the beginning of my time in the convent, I was terribly restless. But soon I found myself happier than I had ever been at my father's house. My beloved gave me the grace to delight people wherever I went, and so it was not long before I became a favorite of the nuns. I still had absolutely no desire to be a nun myself. In fact, I felt a tremendous aversion to the prospect. But I was pleased to see such goodness in the nuns who lived in that house. They all seemed to be pure of heart and utterly devoted to a life of prayer. 
But in spite of this excellent buffer against worldly temptation, the spirit of evil managed to continue taunting me for a while. My friends on the outside unsettled me with a flurry of secret messages. This kind of communication was forbidden, however, which finally allowed me to settle into the rhythms of monastic life, undistracted. The holy inclinations of my early childhood began to return. I could see what a great gift God gives us when He places us in the company of good souls. It seems to me that His Majesty was searching high and low for ways to bring me to Himself. Blessed are you, O Lord, who have put up with me for so long. Amen. There is one thing that may serve as a partial excuse for my many faults. I believe that my intimacy with that unsavory cousin of mine would come to a natural end with her imminent marriage. My spiritual director and other people have assured me that I never did anything to truly set myself against God. Soon, God sent his light in the form of a certain nun who oversaw the dormitory where the secular girls slept to begin showing me the way. Chapter 3 our Lady of Grace. I began to enjoy talking with that nun I mentioned. Our conversations felt sacred. I loved listening to her speak about God. She was simultaneously witty and wise. She never failed to hold my interest. Simply reading that part in the Gospel where the evangelist says, Many are called, but few are chosen, is what drew me into monastic life, she told me. She described the great treasure the Lord shares with those who leave everything for Him. This excellent friendship started to displace the bad habits that had been forming in me. My thoughts drifted back toward God, and my desire for eternal things was returning. I no longer felt that terrible aversion toward the notion of becoming a nun, a feeling I had been convinced would never leave me. Whenever I witness one of the sisters weeping as she prayed or any other overtly spiritual demonstration, I would suffer a wave of envy. To my unending dismay, my own heart was so hardened that even if I read the entire story of Christ's crucifixion, I could not manage to squeeze out a single holy tear. I stayed at Our Lady of Grace for a year and a half, and it did me a great deal of good. I learned to recite some beautiful prayers. I asked the nuns to intercede with God on my behalf, asking Him to transform me in such a way that I would be inclined to give over my life in service to Him. He had not yet blessed me with this desire. Still, while I was resistant to the idea of becoming a nun, the prospect of marriage repelled me even more. By the time I left the convent, I had reconciled myself to becoming a nun. But I had decided not to join that particular house. Their spiritual practices were a little too extreme for me. At least, some of the younger girls impressed me this way. If all of the nuns had behaved consistently, it would have been easier for me to find my way. Plus, I had a close friend named Juana Suarez, who lived in another convent, the Incarnation. This gave me the idea that if I was going to live as a nun, I might as well do it with her. As you can see, I was more motivated by sensual gratification and vanity than by any genuine inclination to perfect my soul. In fact, though monastic urges arose in me now and then, I couldn't persuade myself to follow through with them. Around this time, God decided to prepare me for the life that was best for me. It's not that I had been neglecting my spiritual growth, but I obviously needed a little push. He sent me such a serious illness that I was forced to go home to my father's house. When I began to feel better, they took me to see my sister Maria, who lived in a nearby village. My sister loved me so much that if she could have had her way, I never would have left her home. Maria's husband was also very fond of me. At least he treated me with great tenderness. This is my beloved's grace. I am appreciated and treated beautifully wherever I go. I do nothing to earn this except to simply be who I am. My uncle Pedro lived partway between my father's house and my sister's. He was a sensible, virtuous man 
whose soul God seemed to be making ready for himself. Uncle Pedro's wife had died, and in the last part of his life, he decided to give up everything and become a monk. I believe he left this world in such a way that he is now basking in the joy of God. Uncle Pedro wanted me to spend a few days with him and read to him. All he ever wanted to talk about and read about was the glory of God and the vacuity of the world. Even though I was not interested in his books, I pretended to like them just to please him. All my life, I have labored to please people. In others, this might be a virtue, but in me, it has been a serious shortcoming because I have not been discriminating about it. Oh God, save me. In how many ways did you gradually cultivate my soul to be of use to you? And in how many ways did you hold me back against my will until I could learn to hold myself back? May you be blessed forever. Amen. I only stayed with Uncle Pedro for a short time, but the teachings he exposed me to burned an impression on my heart. The Word of God, both written and spoken, blended with my uncle's excellent company to remind me of what I had known as a small child. Everything is nothing. The world is temporary. All things change and pass away. I came to grips with the reality that my recent illness had almost killed me. This brush with death scared me. I wondered if I would have gone to hell for the things I had done. And so, even though I still did not have an authentic desire to be a nun, I concluded that I would be better off as one. Little by little, I forced myself to embrace that path. This struggle went on for three months. I tried to talk myself into it by arguing that the trials and tribulations of monastic life could not possibly be any more difficult than the miseries of purgatory. As it is, I deserved to go straight to hell. Therefore, I reasoned, it was not such a big deal to spend my time in this world as if I were in purgatory if it guaranteed my undisputed entrance into heaven, which is all I had ever really wanted. This important decision, then, turned out to be motivated more by humble terror than by sublime love. A spirit of evil suggested to me that because I had been raised with wealth and comfort, I would not be able to bear the hardships of religious life. But this just made me think about all that Christ had to go through, and I decided that the least I could do would be to endure a few hardships for his sake. Maybe I believed that Christ would help me to bear those things. I can't remember. I was constantly buffeted by doubts in those days. I started suffering high fevers and fainting spells. My health had always been precarious. It was my love of good books that sustained me. The epistles of St. Jerome filled me with the courage to tell my father about my decision to become a nun. Such a confrontation was as significant to me as actually putting on the habit. I was such an earnest person that once I had given my word, nothing could have persuaded me to go back on it. My father was so attached to me that I was never successful in getting him to agree to my plan. Not even the various people I begged to talk to him were able to convince my father to let me go. The best we could get out of him was a reluctant concession that I could do whatever I wanted after he was dead. But I had no faith in my own ability to persevere. I knew that if I did not act quickly, I would lose my resolve. So I found another way to achieve my goal, as I will now describe. 